Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the WNC Offshore First Quarter 2020 conference call. During today's call, all parties will be in a listen-only mode. Following the company's prepared comments, the call will be open for questions and answers. During the question and answer session, we ask that you limit your questions to one and a follow-up. Please note you can always rejoin the question queue. This conference is being recorded and a replay will be made available on the company's website following the call. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference call over to Al Petrie, Investor Relations Coordinator. Sir, you may begin. Thank you, Operator. And on behalf of the management team, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's conference call to review W&T Offshore's first quarter 2020 financial and operational results. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that our comments may include forward-looking statements. It should be noted that a variety of factors could cause W&T's actual results to differ materially from the anticipated results or expectations expressed in these forward-looking statements. Today's call may also contain certain non-GAAP financial measures. Please refer to the first quarter 2020 earnings release that we released yesterday for a disclosure on forward-looking statements and reconciliations of non-GAAP measures. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Tracy Crone, W&T's Chairman and CEO. Thanks, Al. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our first quarter 2020 conference call. With me today are Janet Yang, our Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, William Williford, our Executive Vice President and General Manager, Gulf of Mexico, Steve Schrader, our Chief Technical Officer, and Jim Hirsch, our Vice President of Geosciences. Uh, they're all available to answer questions later during the call. Over the last several months, the global COVID-19 pandemic, coupled with supply and demand imbalances, have certainly created an environment of uncertainty across the oil sector. We've reacted decisively to those conditions by significantly reducing our capital expenditure budget for the remainder of 2020, lowering our lease operating expenses without compromising safety or operational capabilities, and temporarily shutting in some lower margin operated and non-operated oil weighted properties. As always, we remain committed to the health and safety of our employees and contractors. At our corporate offices, we implemented a mandatory work from home policy in March and only recently reopened our corporate office. Despite being back in the office, we continue to monitor the situation and will follow the advice of government and health leaders. For our field operations, we instituted screening of all personnel prior to entry to heliports and shore bases, as well as our two gas plants in Alabama. We are conducting daily temperature screenings and implemented procedures for distancing and hygiene at our field locations. We're very pleased that thus far, none of our onshore or offshore employees have tested positive for COVID-19. For nearly 40 years, we've been able to persevere through multiple pricing cycles because our focus and strategy has always been to maximize cash flow and constantly improve the profitability of our assets at any commodity price. We expect to continue to find value in acquisitions, especially those that provide a solid foundation for our ability to generate free cash flow, even in the current pricing environment. We built W&T through the right combination of attractive property acquisitions, methodical integration, and exploitation of those acquisitions, and successful development and exploratory drilling on our legacy fields. With the well-timed Mobile Bay acquisition in 2019, our production mix has shifted, and we now produce significantly greater volumes of natural gas. We expect to experience less of an impact from the energy downturn than many of our peers, since natural gas has not been impacted by the same market forces as crude oil and believe we could benefit from higher natural gas prices as associated natural gas production from oil wells decreases. So turning to our first quarter results, we're pleased with our performance. We've integrated our acquired assets at uh, Mobile Bay and at Magnolia, and that's after closing the acquisition of the remaining 25% of that deep water field. Uh, maintained a high level of production and continued uh, generating strong adjusted EBITDA and cash flow. Our costs all came in within or below the guidance we gave for the first quarter. Adjusted EBITDA was $62.1 million, 
despite a weaker pricing environment, while we invested $9.5 million in 2020 CapEx and $24 million in costs related to the 2019 capital program, excluding acquisitions. This is very important because on a cash basis, we continue to create significant value by generating nearly $30 million more of adjusted EBITDA versus our CapEx, which enabled us to reduce long-term debt at a substantial discount. One of the pillars of our success is our ability to generate positive cash flow. In the first quarter of 2020, our production averaged 53,553 barrels oil equivalent per day, or 4.9 million barrels of oil equivalent. That was up 61% compared with the first quarter of 2019, and up slightly compared to the fourth quarter of 2019. This was near the high end of our first uh, quarter guidance range and included a full three months of production from both the Mobile Bay acquisition and the initial 75% interest acquired in the Magnolia field in 2019. Total liquids production comprised 48% of production in the first quarter of 2020. So in late April, we announced that we had temporarily shut in approximately 3,300 barrels oil equivalent per day of net production in selected oil-weighted fields operated by us and also received notice of production curtailments from third-party operators totaling approximately 3,400 barrels oil equivalent per day net to WNT. Recently, about 2,900 BOE per day of those third-party shut-in volumes were returned to production, and we continue to monitor the market to determine the appropriate time to return our operated production curtailments to production. In addition, we temporarily shut in a portion of our production due to Tropical Storm Cristobal with an estimated net impact of about 110,000 net barrels oil equivalent of deferred production in the second quarter. We did not experience any material damage to our facilities due to the storm. As a reminder, we have withdrawn our production and cost guidance for the balance of 2020 due to the combination of uh, ongoing uncertainty in commodity markets, production curtailments, and proactive efforts to continually reduce costs in this lower price environment. We intend to again provide guidance once we have greater visibility in where markets are headed. So for the first quarter of 2020, our average realized sales price per barrel oil equivalent declined about 20% compared with the fourth quarter with declines in pricing for oil, NGLs, and natural gas. Our average realized crude oil sales price was $46.33 per barrel, which once again compared favorably with average WTI pricing of $45.34 per barrel during the period. Our NGL sales price was $13.03 per barrel, and our natural gas price was $1.91 per MCF. Revenues for the first quarter decreased quarter over quarter by 18% to $124.1 million. The decrease was driven by lower realized pricing despite the slight increase in sales volumes. Our first quarter LOE came in at $54.8 million, which was within guidance but higher than both the first and fourth quarters of 2019 due to additional operating costs associated with our two recent acquisitions. Since the sharp downturn in prices in the first quarter, we've developed even more ways to reduce our LOE costs. This includes actions such as reducing our contract labor costs, reducing transportation costs by consolidation of transit to offshore locations, and working with our suppliers to achieve cost savings in maintenance, workover, and facility expenses. We will not reduce our commitment to safety, operational compliance, or environmental protection with any of these actions. In total, we expect to reduce our LOE by about 15 to 25 percent from prior levels. We'll give you more details on the results of these efforts during our second quarter call. Our G&A expense in the first quarter of 2020 was $14 million, which was well below our guidance of 15.5 to 17 million. The decline from 17.6 million in G&A in the fourth quarter of 2019 was due primarily to higher fourth quarter. 2019 accrual adjustments for incentive compensation and lower legal costs during the first quarter of 2020. We continue to look at how we can further reduce our G&A costs. We reported net income in the first quarter of 2020 of $66 million, or $0.46 per share, 
which included $52.5 million in unrealized commodity derivative gain and $18.5 million non-cash gain associated with the debt reduction transaction. Our adjusted net income was $5.8 million, or $0.04 per share. So another way that we've responded to this current environment is by using some of our free cash flow to repurchase a portion of our outstanding 9 and 3 quarters per senior second lien notes. In the first quarter, we repurchased $27.5 million in principle of our outstanding notes for $8.5 million, which led to the non-cash gain. Thus far in the second quarter of 2020, we've repurchased an additional $45.1 million of those same notes for $15.3 million. That's about $72.5 million of long-term debt that we've repurchased year-to-date for just under $24 million, uh, which has reduced our annualized interest expense by over $7 million. We believe that this was a very good use of free cash and will help place WNT on an even better financial footing moving forward. WNT's bank group recently completed its regularly scheduled spring borrowing base redetermination. The borrowing base was set by the bank group at $215 million, down modestly from $250 million. Additionally, the amended agreement provides for the suspension of the total leverage covenant and the addition of a first lien covenant of 2 to 1 through year end 2021. Additional details can be found in our 10Q. The next regularly scheduled redetermination is in the fall of 2020. Additionally, we have added several oil and natural gas hedges since our last call and a detailed schedule is in yesterday's release. So after all these uh, actions so far this year, as of June 17, 2020, our total liquidity stood at $156 million, comprised of about $27 million in cash and $129 million in availability under our revolving credit facility. Our long-term debt remaining on our senior notes has declined to $552.5 million from $625 million. We believe we continue to have a strong balance sheet and have more than sufficient liquidity to uh, meet our needs going forward and uh, to continue to look at good opportunities that may arise in this downturn. Turning now to operations, we successfully drilled one well in the first quarter of 2020 at East Cameron 338-349, but decided to suspend all other drilling activity due to the current uncertain pricing environment. We remain confident in our extensive inventory of high-quality prospects, and we're encouraged by the recent improvement in crude oil prices and the outlook for natural gas price improvements this winter. With that said, we remain focused on cash flow generation in the near and long term, and we will continue to evaluate when it is best for WNT to resume drilling, but at this time we have no active drilling and completions operations. In the first quarter, the Coda well in the East Cameron 338-349 field was successfully drilled in over 290 feet of water and to a total depth of over 6,000 feet. We encountered approximately 100 feet of net oil pay and currently own a 20% interest in the Coda well, which will increase to 38.4% once the well is brought online and performance thresholds are met. Initial production is planned for the first half of 2021, subject to the commodity price environment and the completion of certain infrastructure projects. So during the first quarter, we performed one well recompletion and four workovers that resulted uh, in an additional 700 net BOE per day. As we previously announced, WNT was the apparent high bidder on two blocks in the Gulf of Mexico lease sale 254 held by the BOEM on March 18, which included one deep water block and one shallow water block. These two blocks cover a total of approximately 10,760 acres and, if awarded, we will pay approximately $700,000 for 100% working interest in the awarded leases combined. So in closing, we remain optimistic about the future for WNT. We have a premier portfolio of both shallow water and deep water properties in the Gulf of Mexico with low decline rates and significant upside. The proactive actions that we have undertaken this year to reduce CapEx and LOE coupled with our strong hedge book offering downside protection on commodity prices should allow us to continue to uh, generate strong cash flow, even in a lower pricing environment. 
we remain opportunistic in this environment and we'll look for ways that we can add value to w and as we have done thus far in 2020, reducing LOE costs and closely managing our capital spending. We remain focused on operating efficiently and executing our long-term strategy while maintaining our strong balance sheet to maximize shareholder value. Our management team's interests are highly aligned with those of our shareholders given our 34% stake in w and equity, which is one of the highest of any public e and company. This alignment of interest ensures that we are truly incentivized to maximize shareholder value and mitigate risk. Shareholders should expect to see more acquisitions in the future as well. With that operator, we can open up the lines for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we'll begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star and then one using a touchstone telephone. To withdraw your questions, you may press star and two. If you are using a speakerphone, we do ask that you please pick up your handset before pressing the keys to ensure the best sound quality. To withdraw your questions, once again, you may press star and two. And our first question today comes from John White from Roth Capital. Please go ahead with your question. Good morning and uh, thank you. Uh, congratulations on the good results, uh, Tracy. You. You certainly know the playbook uh, during a downturn. Thanks, John. I uh, thought the buying back the second lien was uh, very opportunistic and a very good move. Um, you mentioned, I believe you said, uh, with regard to further 2020 activity, no new wells are planning to be bud. just wanted to confirm that. And uh, so I take it that means most activity is going to be uh, continued recompletions and workovers. Yeah, I think that's the way we see it right now. Of course, if prices uh, creep on up, then uh, then we'll we'll open up the pocketbook a little bit and, and be able to get some more work done uh, with the drill bit. And uh, you mentioned more uh, to expect more acquisitions in the future. Uh, how how would you describe the deal making landscape in the Gulf uh, given uh, given the current environment? Well, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, most of the uh, the companies that uh, that have had problems are, are going to uh, get eliminated or absorbed. Uh, the ones that, that don't are, are going to continue to succeed. Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much. I'll pass it along. Thank you, sir. Our next question comes from Richard Tullis from Capital One Securities. Please go ahead with your question. Hey, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, morning, Richard. Tracy, I, I know um, you withdrew guidance for the full year and, and just had a couple of comments on, with the last um, caller on, on um, activity. But what do you think it takes to kind of get back to even you know moderate growth mode, say in the second half of the year and in, in, uh, into 2021? What sort of oil price would you be looking at? And combination of service cost reductions? Well, that's a fairly complex question, Richard. Uh, it's got many uh, moving parts to it. Uh, if I was going to guess a price, I'd tell you something around 50 uh, would, would make us feel pretty comfortable. Uh, we, we, uh, we recognize that uh, service companies have had their issues as well. Everybody's struggling with, uh, with personnel and, and, uh, and the, the, the pandemic, of course. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, uh, the future is, is pretty good long term, uh, and that's what uh, that's what we're looking at. We 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 realize that there's some things that uh, uh, need to happen in in our in in this basin to make it better for everyone. Uh, so you know we're we're waiting to see uh, uh, what uh, what pricing is going to do. That's the biggest driver. I wish I could tell you that. Uh, it isn't, but uh, but it is. I think we're adequately hedged at this point, or close to it. Uh, so I, I'm I'm confident that that we can with with uh, withstand just about anything. Of course, every time I say that, something else nasty happens. So I guess I probably ought to stop saying that. But but uh, but I, I think we're we're pretty well uh, protected at this point. No, thank you for that. That's helpful. And then from from my follow up, right here, Janet. What what is the Corporate decline rate at this point, given the um, you know the reduction in capex. 
Uh, corporate decline rate, I'm not sure I understand that term. Do you mean the production decline rate or the corporate? I don't know yeah. what a corporate decline yeah, rate is. Yeah, yeah, for the, for oh. the entire company, it's production-based. Uh, uh, the RP is about 10. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Tracy, thank you. Yes, sir. Our next question comes from Mike Scala from Stiefel. Please go ahead with your question. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, Tracy, you mentioned uh, you'd like to see something around 50 before you got active again with a drill bit. I'm wondering, kind of along the same lines, um, what kind of price or can you pin a price on what you'd need to see before you bring the shut-in volumes back online? Well, actually, we're starting to be, uh, to bring those shut-in volumes back online now. So that, that should give you some encouragement. Um, some of them, a couple of these fields that, uh, that were, were near end of life anyway uh, and were, were just kind of hanging on, uh, those probably won't be coming back online. So um, I, I think we'll get up fairly quickly with, uh, with the production of, of the stuff that was, was uh, brought online that, that's not just anemic. Okay, good. And uh, I want to get your, your thoughts on uh, use free cash flow, obviously very opportunistic, as was pointed out on uh, paying down uh, the, the second lien. Um, looking forward, would that be the preference, or how, how do you balance that between paying down the revolver since now you have the, uh, the covenant is just uh, focused on first lien debt, so, and, and also any, any restrictions on uh, paying down either of those two? Well, actually, the latter part of your, your, your questions there is more um, uh, conducive to what we're, we're likely to do. Uh, we're, we, we don't have the uh, 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 first lien capability of, of going out and spending more money to buy debt. Apparently, the, the RBLs uh, don't like you buying debt from other people and, and, and putting theirs at risk. So uh, that's, that is the, uh, the covenant uh, with, with regard to uh, buying more, uh, more uh, second lien debt. Very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Our next question comes from Patrick Fitzgerald from Baird. Please go ahead with your question. Hi guys, uh, yeah, I echo, I echo the sentiments on the debt repurchase. Uh, well done. Um, so a lot of my questions have been asked, but uh, I wanted to ask, um, I guess Janet, uh, working capital uh, for the remainder of the year, you that was a nice source of cash this quarter. Um, wh how do you expect that to uh, unfold for the remainder of twenty? I think with um, activity going down, I don't expect it to be, we don't expect there, I mean, generally speaking, we're forecasting out, we're not, we're not uh, forecasting, we, we take a conservative stance on it, but um, yeah, I, mean, I think working capital should be okay, be relatively flat the rest of the year. Um, I think a lot of corrections on the Fed um, has been made in the first kind of second quarter. Okay. And then on um, your plug and abandonment, your the current portion of that on the balance sheet uh, declined from 22 to three. Um, is, is that just a timing issue? What and and if you could um, talk about uh, how you see that unfolding in 20, and I guess you know any further than that would be helpful. Thank you. It is a timing issue, and. Um you know, Mike, Trace, you can comment on that a little bit more as well. Yeah, um, there, there's no overwhelming obligation to, to do uh, the ARO work as as, uh, as as we've forecasted it so far for the rest of the year. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Our next question comes from Ray Deacon from Petro Lotus Analytics. Please go ahead with your question. Yeah. Hey, good morning, Tracy. Um, hey, right. I was right. wondering um good, good, thanks. Um I, I was wondering how the three and a half year roughly payout on repurchasing debt compares to the recompletions uh that that you're planning to do this year in terms of uh you know what kind of return you're getting. Ah, oh, you finally asked the right question. How does it compare <laughs> to other things that we might want to do? Very good, right? 
Yeah, yeah, now you got it. <laughs> yeah, do we do we buy more debt back or do we go out and try to make more money doing acquisitions and drilling wells? That's really the, the eternal question for us, right? Yep. Uh, so that's that's exactly how we're looking at it. You got it. Uh what what makes more sense and, and it's it's a pretty perfunctory function uh when you when you uh when you get to the bottom of it. Uh, what what is more profitable? So it's really it's really fairly it was a fairly easy give to say all right well we're we're not going to buy back any more debt we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and, and do more work so we're we're approaching that kind of marginality uh, with with that decision which way do you go so you know as the price goes up the the decision gets real easy okay got it. And then just, uh, what, what's the update on the JV? I think you drilled nine out of 14 wells was the last number I'd seen. Is that kind of the first thing you go after once you uh, get back to drilling? Or? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Our next question comes from Neil Dingman from SunTrust. Please go ahead with your question. Morning, Mr. Crown and team. Hey, Neil. How are you? Hey, good, good. My my first question, uh, just build it on what Ray was saying. Tracy, uh, I like the um, acquisition you did that you, I guess you closed in early March where you did the purchase and sale agreement to quite acquire that 25% remaining working interest. To me, that always seems to be the most economical when you can continue to do that. Uh, you know, again, do you have other opportunities to add working interest like that? I mean, to me, obviously, you don't have to use any more. Uh, you know, expenses to do so, and always seems to be the most economic. So, just wondering if you have more opportunities like that in the portfolio. Let me see if I can explain this very concisely. You can bet your ass on it, okay? <laughs> I think I think it would be concise. Okay. Very, very, very good. And then just my follow up to that would be. Uh, just, you know, given what we see now in this environment, uh, you know, we've certainly seen onshore prices on services come down. Could you just talk, call her on, you know, now when you go back to work, what you're seeing in prices today versus even six or 12 months ago? Yeah, uh, you know, I commented on this last year when, when people were telling me that the prices were going up. Oil was 60 something dollars a barrel and and service costs were going up, and, and I always thought that was seasonal. And uh, sure enough, it was not only seasonal, but unfortunately, uh, prices began to drop as well, so activity went down. So yeah, there, there's, there's certainly a, a point at which you, you can't go any lower because your suppliers just can't get their, uh, their costs down any further. So you know, we, we, we don't want to see that happen. Uh, we want people to people to be able to operate at a profit. Uh, on the other hand, the, the the hard part for us is is making sure that we have access to quality personnel and equipment. And I think we're we're pretty close to that uh, margin right now. So it, it, it's got to be some some uh, uh, sort of rebalancing going along, and and it and, and it really has more. The, the the biggest impact is transportation, boats and helicopters, and, uh, Very and good. Then, you know insurance and then personnel. Got it, got it. Very good. Thanks and uh, nice cash flow. Sure, thank you. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star and one. Our next question comes from Dustin Tillman from Wells Fargo. Please go ahead with your question. Hi, thanks for taking the call. So sure. I wanted to ask about the surety market. We've seen in some instances some of your competitors where sureties are asking for collateral, including one scenario where the company suing or the surety suing the company. Um, what do you see as the health of the surety market? Any changes that are happening there as some of your competitors are under pressure? Well, again, uh, w without knowing the specifics, it's hard for me to answer that. Uh, we haven't uh, we haven't experienced any issues with our sureties. In fact, the experience has been quite the opposite. Uh, the company's in, in good shape. We're, we're meeting all of our obligations, and and we'll be able to do so for uh, hopefully for the rest of my lifetime. Uh, so I, I don't really see any any angst among the sureties. 
Uh, markets okay, go so up and down. You know, rates go up and down a little bit depending upon how the markets are. But other than that, we're, we're not experiencing any any anxiety at all. So they're not asking. There's no calls for collateral from the surety. No, sir. Okay, great. And can I? I wanted to follow up on one of the previous questions that was asked about P and A obligations, and maybe for uh, you could just help us better understand. Usually, thinking about uh, shutting in wells and having you, you talked about some production that won't come back online. Uh, most people would expect that that would result in more near-term P&A spend, and it sounds like you you're saying that you have the ability to push some of that off. So can you just explain or help us understand the time frame of when that P&A work would have to be done? Now, generally, after you se cease production, you're required to plug an abandonment within a year. So, and I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me, 18 months. So, yeah, so they're at least 18 months down the line. Uh, clearly, if you go out and you, you put a field back online, you, you got to go out and make these, these visits every once in a while anyway. Uh, so if, if prices get up high enough, you put them back online, and then you defer it for yet another 18 months. But we're at least 18 months or close to that away from, from having to do any of those abandonments on those marginal fields. Okay, and that's why the the uh, current P&A liability was reduced, because the view is that can be delayed. That's correct. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, at this time, in showing no additional questions, we'll end today's question and answer session. I'd like to turn the conference call back over to Tracy Crone for any closing remarks. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. We appreciate it, and uh, we'll, we'll have another conversation next quarter, if not sooner. Thanks so much. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, the conference has now concluded. We do thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect your lines.